Hello, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Alex Schwartz. I am the Deputy Director for the uh, Center for Comparative and Public Law here at HKU Faculty of Law. And uh, we at the Center for Comparative and Public Law and the Faculty of Law are truly delighted uh, this evening to be hosting this talk by Dr. Michael Hamilton on freedom of assembly and protest policing. This is one of a series of events that the Center for Comparative and Public Law will be hosting for knowledge exchange with academics and the broader community here with a view to fostering a better understanding of some of the very challenging issues that we are currently facing here in Hong Kong today. Dr. Hamilton is senior lecturer in public protest law at University of East Anglia and also a recurring visiting professor at the Central European University, formerly in Budapest, soon to be in Vienna. Uh, before that, he was co-director of the Transitional Justice Institute at the University of Ulster, um, where he was also senior lecturer at the Transitional Justice Institute. He is a member and secretary of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. And indeed, Dr. Hamilton was lead author of the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights Venice Commission Guidelines on Freedom of Peaceful Assembly. He has contributed to numerous opinions on draft legislation dealing with public assemblies through the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights Legislative Support Unit and the Technical Assistance and Information Exchange Instrument of the European Commission. Dr. Hamilton was also previously a member of the Euro-Mediterranean Human Rights Network's Freedom of Assembly Steering Group. He has served previously as well as Human Rights Advisor to the Northern Ireland Office's Strategic Review of Parading and has twice presented oral evidence to the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee uh, during his time uh, when he was uh, based in Belfast. Dr. Hamilton has published very widely on issues of freedom of assembly in some of the world's most prestigious academic journals, and he continues to be a much sought after expert on these topics. So without a doubt, uh, we are extremely fortunate indeed to have Dr. Hamilton here with us this evening to speak about freedom of assembly and protest policing issues which are particularly relevant for us here in Hong Kong in these very challenging times that we face. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Hamilton this evening. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, a very sincere thanks to, to Alex and to the Center for Comparative and Public Law for this wonderful invitation uh, to be uh, in Hong Kong and to give this talk at such a time as this. Uh, I wanted just to start by saying I'm based at uh, the University of East Anglia in Norwich in the southeast of England, as Alex has said, and it's still the only law school that I, that I know of that offers courses specifically in public protest law and uh, dissent and protest. Um, but I'm not from Norwich. I'm based there at the moment, uh, and those of you who might be able to pick up on regional accents will detect uh, a certain Belfast tinge. Uh, and I'm originally from Belfast, and uh, actually I've known Alex for over 10 years, and we first um, met many years ago, uh, and one of the greatest memories I have is of visiting the streets of North Belfast with Alex to watch and observe the policing of contentious parades uh, there. And for better or for worse, uh, Belfast and Northern Ireland also have uh, water cannon to use uh, against protesters. Um, sometimes to particularly uh, effective uh, ends and I wanted to start with this idea of a Northern Ireland connection, largely because when I was reading around, I was struck by the number of reports that make parallels or attempt to draw analogies between what is currently happening in Hong Kong and the conflict in, in Northern Ireland. And again, this is something that Alex and I have been talking a little bit about and trying to gauge to what degree this is a valid parallel. But I want to just draw a couple of things out of, of the parallel, if I may. Of course, 
There are an over, there's an overlap in personalities who have been involved in Hong Kong and Northern Ireland, the most obvious being Chris Patton, who, when he left here, went to Northern Ireland to chair the Independent Commission on Police Reform. Um, as you'll see uh, in this next slide, um, Paddy Ashdown, who has commented on the public order ordinance um, here, also, when Alex was giving his introduction, referred to the strategic review of parading in Northern Ireland, and it was Paddy Ashdown who chaired that body for three years, and I had the privilege of being the, the human rights advisor to him during that time. But just to think about this, this Northern Ireland question, and I think from what I've read, a number of strands are drawn out in the analysis. So some people say um, there's an element of national identity that is a driving force, and that is a parallel that can be drawn. That the protest movements here are triggered by a public grievance around a, a very particular issue, and there are, again, similarities with Northern Ireland, though I don't think either Hong Kong or Northern Ireland hold a monopoly on protests uh, being driven by grievances on public issues. But perhaps more particularly, I think um, the conflict in Northern Ireland was characterized by a significant erosion of trust in the police to the point that you would say there's been a crisis and there was a, a very real crisis of legitimacy in policing in Northern Ireland. And that this crisis of legitimacy was exacerbated and sustained by police interventions regarding um, freedom of assembly. And one of the things when I talk about protest uh, and policing is that I sometimes feel it's a, it's a sideshow and what I'm talking about is a diversion from the real issue. Protesters are trying to put a substantive issue on the political agenda, whether that's environmental concerns or issues about corruption or electoral malpractice, and to get drawn into the side issue of how the police engage with protesters almost seems like you're taking the spotlight away from the real issue. And what I feel about Northern Ireland and what I feel about here is that actually the issue of protest policing is the issue or at least is symptomatic of a core issue um, around the maintenance of order. So I don't feel that it, it's such a diversion um, when I start this talk. So Paddy Ashdown's comment uh, about the public order ordinance is going to be something of a, of a theme, I think, in, in what I'm going to focus on. In the, in the talk. Um, what Paddy Ashdown did in Northern Ireland was to review the legal mechanisms that were set up to regulate public processions there. And I'm going to drop the Northern Ireland parallel for now. I'm very happy to pick up on it again in questions and answers if people wish to. Um, and there are interesting things, I suppose, about the, the reform of the police and the novel institutional mechanisms that were designed to enable police reforms to take root. Um, and one of those was, was the Northern Ireland Parades Commission, which was a civic body set up to take away from the police the public order decision-making powers that they'd previously had, so that the police weren't making decisions and then enforcing them. You had the Parades Commission who took the controversial decisions, and then the police could simply say, we're implementing the Parades Commission's decision. So it took some of the heat. It was like a lightning conductor. It took some of the heat away from the police at a crucial time. Um, but my focus is going to be uh, on the legal basis of the regulation of protests here, and that is obviously, as you all know, the public order uh, ordinance. And given the time constraints, I'm afraid I'm going inevitably to be somewhat selective in, in what I focus on. We could no doubt spend an entire day working through the very convoluted provisions of the, uh, the public order ordinance. But I want to begin uh, against the backdrop of Paddy Ashdown's statement by looking at what the UN Human Rights Committee has said about the public order ordinance 
uh, in Hong Kong. And I think it's significant that this goes right back to 1999. Um, so when Hong Kong was, had its first periodic review by the UN Human Rights Committee, the public order ordinance was very much in its, uh, in its sights. Um, and this is a piece of legislation dating from 1967, so it predates all the current crisis, if you like, uh, and I think that's something worth just reflecting on. But the UN Human Rights Committee was quite scathing in what it said uh, about the public order ordinance. It said that um, the ordinance could be applied in a way to unduly restrict the enjoyment of the rights guaranteed by Article 21, which is the right of peaceful assembly. There are many other things the, the committee focused on. They talked about um, in investigations of police misconduct. They talked about covert surveillance. They talked about the intimidation and harassment of journalists. But they focused on the public order ordinance and concluded that the administration should review the ordinance in order to bring its terms into compliance with the International Covenant on Civil uh, and Political Rights. Now, if we move forward to um, 2013, and this is the third report submitted by Hong Kong to the Human Rights Committee in this third cycle uh, of Hong Kong's review by the, the committee. Again, the public order ordinance uh, crops up. Um, and I'm sorry for the small text and the slides. I was just trying to capture as much as I could there of what the, the committee had said. But it talked about um, this offence of unlawful assembly, which the committee said may facilitate excessive restriction on covenant rights. It talked about the significant number of arrests and prosecutions um, against demonstrators. Um, and it talked about the use of video recording by the police uh, during demonstrations. Now, if you recall from the previous slide, the committee had concluded in 1999 that the administration here should review the public order ordinance. And I think it's interesting that in 2013, they seem to have dropped that requirement and saying instead that its implementation should be in conformity with uh, the covenant. And that, I think, is perhaps a, a mistake. I would argue quite strongly that there is still a need to review the core terms of, of the ordinance, not merely trying to ensure that it is implemented in uh, conformity with the covenant. And Against that backdrop, I want then to, to frame this discussion by the current activities of the Human Rights Committee and to fast forward again from 2013 right to the present day. And some of you may be very well aware of the standard-setting exercise that the Human Rights Committee is currently engaged in in drafting a general comment on freedom of assembly. And a general comment... Um, oh, my slide's running on. Uh, a general comment is meant to be uh, a document that illuminates the key rights in the covenant. Uh, it provides a basis for the committee's own work in reviewing this, the report submitted by states and provides a benchmark also for uh, cases that come before the committee. So when an individual submits a complaint to the committee, the standards as enunciated in the general comment will be used by the committee uh, to adjudicate on, on the complaint. And the Human Rights Committee is currently in the process of drafting General Comment 37. A couple of years ago, it drafted a General Comment on Freedom of Expression, but this is the first time it has ever done uh, and written a General Comment on Freedom of Assembly. So back in March, it had a half-day discussion 
dedicated to what this general comment should say. If you go on to the committee's website, you will find around 40 submissions. I think it's interesting that 10% of those, or four of them, came from uh, parties and a coalition of NGOs here in Hong Kong, and those were excellent submissions, again, highlighting some of the challenges faced under the, the public order ordinance. Um, and where we are now is that the committee, as of the very end of last week, literally Friday, um, is almost at the point of uh, agreeing the first draft um, and the first reading of the first draft of the general comment. My understanding is that on Thursday of this coming week, um, that draft should be finalised and it will then be circulated for consultation not only to NGO groups and stakeholders but also to states and that that consultation will be open until the end of January and then there will be the process of the second reading of the general comment which will take through 2020 uh, and the, the committee in 2020 will have three sessions uh, and they will devote uh, a lot of discussion time in 2020 to finalizing the text of this general comment. Now, I'll come back to the importance of general comment 37 at the end, but I think it's, it's important to recognize that this is ongoing. I'll refer to, to some of the draft text of general comment as we go through and as I think about some of the, the terms of the, the public order ordinance. Um, so, <coughs> the first thing I want to say um, about what the Human Rights Committee looks for is the requirements of the legal framework in a country. Um, and this isn't just the public order law, this is the whole matrix of laws that potentially touches on the regulation of freedom of assembly. So that's Public order laws, yes, but traffic laws, policing laws, entertainment laws, uh, and all of those. And what the committee has quite clearly said in its, both its jurisprudence and in its concluding observations on other states is that um, the, the legal framework must create an enabling environment for the effective uh, exercise of the right to freedom of assembly. And... It's interesting just to dwell on what, what does it mean to effectively exercise the right to freedom of assembly. I don't know if there are any social movement scholars in the room. One of the things that I would argue about social movement theory in general is that it often fails to pay sufficient attention to the operation of legal provisions on the strategic choices that social movements make. And I would suggest that the legal provisions and having a very granular, empirical assessment of the effect of those legal provisions on the choices of social movements, on the strategies that social movements take, is really quite important. We talk in loose terms about the chilling effect of laws on different social movement actors. Uh, it's, I think there's a real need to conduct empirical analysis of what that chilling effect is and how it derives specifically from individual legal provisions. So that's it's a little bit of an aside, but I think uh, it is important just when we underscore the centrality of the legal framework to the effective enjoyment of the right to freedom of assembly. So in the remainder of the time, I want to focus on four issues, and I may not uh, get through all my slides with equal attention, but I'll do my best. Um, and there are four things I want to focus upon. The first is the question of what are the core state obligations in relation to the right of peaceful assembly? And how do those core state obligations influence the role of the police? What do they tell us about what the central role of the police ought to be. Then I want to look at the specific offence under the public order ordinance of unlawful assembly. Then I want to talk about face coverings and masks and the ban that uh, you all know has been introduced here in that regard. And finally, I want to say a little bit just about the important role played by monitors and journalists and the developing human rights protections specifically in that area. So, 
let's just think about state obligations and the role of the police. The Public Order Ordinance quite clearly sets out its vision for what the role of the police and the role of the authorities ought to be. Section 6 says that the Commissioner of the Police may control and direct the conduct of all public gatherings. And what I want to suggest that when we're thinking about the role of the police and the language that is used here, terminology is really important. And this idea of controlling and directing the exercise of the right to freedom of assembly, I would argue, errs too strongly into the management of assemblies. And it is a departure from what I would argue a human rights approach entails, which is that freedom of assembly ought to be facilitated and protected by the state, not controlled and directed, not managed principally, but facilitated and protected. And any of you who have looked at the draft General Comment 37 will note that the language around state obligations in the draft General Comment talks about accommodating freedom of assembly. And that language has actually now been dropped. This is as a result of the dialogue within the Human Rights Committee in July and in October, and there was a feeling that saying states had an obligation to accommodate freedom of assembly as the overarching obligation didn't go far enough, that the idea of accommodation was akin to merely tolerating freedom of assembly. So what the committee has now done, and as will be reflected in the, uh, in the draft when it is circulated, hopefully very soon, is that the overarching obligation of the state is to respect and ensure the right to freedom of assembly. And that has both a negative and a positive component. The negative component, often overlooked actually, is that states should refrain from interfering with the exercise of the right to freedom of assembly. That should be the starting point. The starting point shouldn't be that states think, how do we regulate protests in the street? The starting point should be, Nothing needs regulation unless there's a convincing and a compelling uh, reason for uh, intervening. And then in terms of the positive obligations of states, it's not, as I say, accommodate, but it's about facilitating and protecting the right to freedom of assembly. So, again, just to emphasize, the language is important, and I think the Public Order Ordinance sets up the role of the authorities in a fundamentally uh, wrong way and a way that is at variance with these human rights standards. Significantly, paragraph 11 of the draft general comment also says that these obligations to protect human rights still persist where an assembly ceases to be peaceful. So we have to remember it's not just that we're talking about one single right, the right of peaceful assembly, we're talking about the whole panoply of rights protected under the covenant. And just because an assembly may cease to be peaceful and may therefore fall out of the protection of Article 21, that does not diminish the requirement that other rights still must be protected um, by the authorities. So just to dwell a little bit more on these obligations and their impact on protest policing, I wanted to say a little bit about what the academic literature uh, says in relation to protest policing styles. And there are a number of different styles. And these, I should caution at the very start, these are ways of helping us think about how police respond to protests. They're not mutually exclusive, okay? So I'm going to talk about four different styles very briefly of protest policing. They overlap. It's not that the policing of protests in one country falls into one category or the other, and you will see elements that are familiar uh, in, in each of these different policing styles. And the first style is what's known as escalated force, um, sometimes referred to as the iron fist approach. Uh, and this uh, saying on the, on the right-hand side, when you're in riot gear, everything looks like a riot, comes from a saying, I don't know if it translates well here, but there's a saying in Ireland that if all you have is a hammer, then all you see are nails, okay? And so it, it in some way reflects the idea that however you equip your police will determine how the police then respond to those that they are confronted with. Um, but escalated force is 
quite self-explanatory. It is essentially the use of force, whether that's arrests, beatings, tear gas, uh, and other weapons, to quell protests by inflicting pain and suffering. And I've used Lord Scarman's quote when he did a review of the Red Lion Square disorders in London in the 1980s. He said that the approach of the police then uh, had the effect of treating public order as the quietism imposed by successful repression. And I venture to suggest that that's not the vision of public order that any of us in this room wish to see realized. But that is uh, part and parcel of an escalated force approach. Now, in response, and as uh, policing perhaps became more sophisticated, and as, as it, it became apparent that escalated force did not necessarily solve these problems, police began to use what um, is known as a negotiated management style of policing. And I am not going to touch at all on the notification stroke authorization requirements in the public order ordinance. Again, we could spend an entire day talking about that and the, the, the notice of no objection and so on. But essentially, the negotiated management style of policing is predicated on notification about assemblies being given. That notification is a trigger then for negotiation, perhaps, with the authorities. It suggests that there's a more consensual approach to the, uh, I'm going to use the word, management of protest, because I think negotiated management, despite suggesting consensual policing, is still a more subtle form of managing protest. And it brings with it very real concerns that um, the police are actually co-opting or routinizing or neutralizing the, the sting of protests by trying to engage in a friendly dialogue with protesters and thereby core choreographing exactly what protesters may do. And you see this approach of protest policing playing out in a number of ways. The picture on the slide there is of a police liaison officer and we have these friendly police liaison officers uh, in, the, in the UK here there, uh, helpfully serving lunch along with uh, environmental protesters, I think, in London. Um, but it's not just the UK where dialogue policing or liaison policing ha has, has been rolled out. Um, and there are some groups that are really quite concerned about the role that these dialogue police serve. They would argue that it's not simply dialogue, but that they actually engage in gathering evidence. And if they're to serve any useful role within the police chain of command, all they can do is to feed that evidence back into the police operational planning. So it becomes essentially another means of, of surveilling protesters and gathering evidence about them. So that's negotiated management with a fairly skeptical view. How long? Thanks. Okay. No rush. <laughs> no good. Um, so very quickly, other two uh, policing styles that are sometimes uh, referred to are, first of all, the idea of strategic incapacitation. It doesn't sound very positive, uh, and nor is it. Um, this, actually, uh, many of scholars associate with the Occupy movement and the idea that when protesters recoiled from pre-planning and providing notice and pre-negotiating with the police. The police then sought to uh, find other ways of uh, preventively uh, intervening. And so there are three strategies, if you like, that are associated with this strategic incapacitation, zoning, surveillance, and information control. Zoning is simply about ensuring that the different parties are kept quite strictly within certain designated zones and in different places you can see hard zones and soft zones and zones for the press and so on, but it is about the spatial management of freedom of assembly. Um, surveillance, um, something that we might come back to uh, when we think about the masks issue in a, in a moment, but police engaging in increasingly perhaps sophisticated forms of surveillance which they mine then for actionable intelligence. Uh, and information control. So what they mean by information control is that there's a battle for hearts and minds actually and that the police try and uh, present 
information to the public that styles protesters as violent, as presenting a threat. When we're talking about protest camps, the protest camps become dens of criminality and virtually all the kind of negative stereotypes that you can imagine become uh, used and weaponized in this attempt to control the flow of information. So that's strategic incapacitation. The last one there, command and control, is, uh, you know, in some ways similar to escalated force. It involves uh, a very hardline approach to protests and particularly to minor infractions of the law in protests. It derives from broken windows theory, where in a street, if you, the, the, the idea is that if you have a single broken window, unless that window is quickly dealt with, there will be a, a sharp deterioration in public order. So minor infractions are not tolerated, and the police clamp down quite harshly on those kinds of things uh, within protests. And that emerged, uh, or that development is often associated with the battle in Seattle in 1999 um, and the, the protests there around the, the, the WTO uh, ministerial conference in Seattle. As I say, zero tolerance, tolerance for disorder and a very hierarchical management, micromanagement of, uh, of assemblies. And it's, it's associated too with uh, a militarization or a paramilitarization of the police. And it's not just, and this isn't in any way meant to be a consolation, it's not just in Hong Kong that you see militarization of the police. And there's a lot of work that has been done in the US about increasingly militarized policing. And you can think about the Ferguson uh, riots uh, and so on, more recent events there too. And all I want to say, uh, I, I said this to Alex when he extended the invitation, that I didn't want to come here and talk about standards on human rights policing. I didn't want to come here and reel off what the basic principles and the use of force say. We can all read what the basic principles say. They emphasize force as a last resort. They emphasize the standards of strict necessity. Um, and I don't think it's terribly interesting to rehearse those basic standards. But what I do just want to mention are uh, a couple of new developments in this area. Uh, and they are these guidelines that have been published just recently by uh, the UN relating to less lethal weapons uh, in, in law enforcement. And these guidelines, I think I can maybe put the PowerPoint slides up. These are hyperlinked as well if anybody wants to access them later. Um, the guidelines give very specific guidance on the use of kinetic projectiles, that's rubber bullets and so on, the use of tear gas, the use of water cannon, and also things like independent oversight of, of policing. So um, those guidelines, I think, are worth having a look at. And uh, just to give a quick sense of some things they say, they say the human rights of participants shall be respected and protected even if an assembly is considered unlawful by the authorities. So this is a segue to my next point, which is about unlawful assemblies under Section 18 of the Public Order Ordinance, okay? The rights of participants should be respected and protected even if an assembly is considered to be unlawful. And crucially, and this is at the heart of everything that I say this evening, there is an obligation on the authorities to distinguish between the individuals who are behaving violently and those who remain peaceful in their own behavior. Okay, and that is what I would argue, and as I will argue, is one of the problems with the public order ordinance. It allows those who remain peaceful in their behavior to be caught up and to be held liable for mere presence at events where others are um, perhaps behaving violently. We all know that the right of peaceful assembly is the right of peaceful assembly, uh, and with that comes this key obligation on the authorities and on the police to distinguish between those who are behaving peacefully and to continue, therefore, to protect the right of assembly of those who uh, remain peaceful. And this you know, also derives from crowd psychology. There's been a lot of work looking at how um, if the police treat crowds as a single, undifferentiated mass 
that that quickly becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there is a need to differentiate um, between uh, those different parts of a crowd. So let's move on quickly to section 18. Um, I know this is a provision that many of you will be familiar with, and I feel slightly hesitant coming here and even trying to put this on a slide, uh, let alone talk about it. But I want just to flag what I think are some key problem, problematic aspects about this provision, which many of you will also know is the predicate offence for Section 19 of the Public Order Ordinance, which is the riot offence. So riot will only be made out if there's an unlawful assembly. So what is here is, is, is of critical importance also to the charge of riot. So it says, when three or more persons assembled together conduct themselves in a disorderly, intimidating, insulting or provocative manner, intended or likely to cause any person reasonably to fear that the person so assembled will commit a breach of the peace, or will by such con conduct provoke other persons to commit a breach of the peace, they are an unlawful assembly. Okay, so that's the three people gathered at which such activities occur constitutes an unlawful assembly. Then it says in subsection three that any person who takes part in an assembly which is an unlawful assembly under subsection one will be virtue of the offence, uh, will be guilty of the offence of unlawful assembly and liable to conviction of up to five years in indictment um, and three years imprisonment at, at a summary level. And I want just to say, and I'm going to run through these very, very quickly, um, that there are at least five possible issues with um, Section 18. Um, first of all, it emphasizes unlawfulness as a standard rather than peacefulness. Okay, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. I've got slides on each of these five points. Um, so it, it, it emphasizes unlawfulness rather than non-peacefulness. It also, as I was saying a moment ago, fails to require an individualized assessment of the peaceful conduct of participants in an assembly. So it risks treating an assembly as an undifferentiated mass. Also, I think the threshold for what can be characterized as an unlawful assembly is very low. So the inclusion of the words insulting and provocative are actually speech actions that ought to be protected or that are protected under international human rights standards and freedom of speech. Freedom of speech protects insulting speech. It protects provocative speech. And linked to that, Section 18 says that an unlawful assembly will be made out if others are provoked to commit a breach of the peace. So if you can, have, if you can be charged with being uh, a member of an unlawful assembly because of the actions of others in committing a breach of the peace, that effectively sets up what is a heckler's veto, that the actions of others end up heckling, they end up having repercussions restricting your right to freedom of peaceful assembly, okay? And in light of all of those preceding four points, then these maximum sentences of three years or five years imprisonment seem really manifestly excessive. But just quickly to go over some of the standards that underpin those points that I've just made. What you'll see here is that I'm referring quite often to case law from the European Court of Human Rights, and there's a reason for this. The European Court of Human Rights has probably been the most pioneering supranational court in the area of freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. The UN Human Rights Committee has been a bit slow to catch up in this respect. Having said that, there are probably now around 100 decisions of the UN Human Rights Committee which touch on freedom of assembly. Some of them might be... Uh, framed as freedom of expression issues, but there is a significant jurisprudence of Human Rights Committee uh, decisions relating to freedom of assembly. The European Court of Human Rights has been very good. Equally, the European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence has some problems as well, and that 
is uh, in large part because they sometimes defer to states, they sometimes grant a margin of appreciation to states, and I think it's one of the reasons that we need to be quite cautious as well when we look at the, the European Court of Human Rights case law, or certainly the outcomes of those cases. But what the European Court of Human Rights does do quite well is to set up some of the standards, to articulate some of the, the core principles. So they've said, for example, that a situation of unlawfulness, such as an unnotified assembly, does not of itself justify interference with the right of assembly. In other words, the absence of prior notification and the unlawfulness of an event because of no notification does not give carte blanche to the authorities um, in how they respond. The, author the authorities are still bound by the requirements of proportionality and uh, necessity. In draft general comment 37, uh, the UN Human Rights Committee has said that isolated incidents will not suffice to taint an entire assembly as violent. And this is really relevant for um, Section 18 of the Public Order Ordinance, okay? Uh, you cannot infer from the fact that violence occurs that the entire assembly is therefore undeserving of protection. Um, and the European Court of Human Rights has made a very similar point. It says that an individual does not cease to enjoy their right to freedom of peaceful assembly as a result of sporadic violence or punishable acts committed by others in the course of the demonstration so long as that individual themselves remains peaceful in his her, or her own intentions um, or behavior. Similarly, too, the idea that um, potential disorder arising from the reaction to assembly is uh, a reason to intervene. The European Court of Human Rights has said the possibility of violent counter-demonstrations or indeed extremists with violent tensions within the organization that's assembling cannot take away the right of assembly from those who remain peaceful. So even if there's a real risk of a procession or a meeting, resulting in disorder by developments outside the control of those organizing it, such a procession or such a meeting does not, for this reason alone, fall outside the scope of the right to freedom of assembly. So I think all of these standards, even if they come from the Strasbourg court, which isn't directly relevant, are referred to actually in, in general comment 37, the UN Human Rights Committee draws in the Strasbourg Court's case law and uh, are really quite relevant to our thinking about Section 18. I said these words insulting and provocative create a low threshold. Well, I think they do. From the European Court of Human Rights, freedom of speech extends to ideas that offend, shock and disturb. Um, European Court of Human Rights has said it's, it's the essence of a democracy to allow diverse political projects to be debated, even those that call into question the way in which a state is currently organized. Um, and General Comment 34 on the right to freedom of speech uh, embraces even expression that might be regarded as deeply offensive and talks about protecting expression that is considered to be insulting, that that is not of itself sufficient to justify the imposition of penalties. Um, and then there are, there are other cases, I'm going to have to speed up here, but there are other cases that reject the idea that the reaction to a speaker or the reaction to an assembly can justifiably result in restrictions on the assembly. This is a case from Hungary where Mr. Vonai wore a red star on his, his jacket and there was a law in Hungary that prohibited the wearing of the red star and he was arrested because of a fear of disorder on the part of the audience that had assembled. And the court said that to arrest Mr. Vonai for wearing the red star was to create a heckler's veto and that the right to freedom of speech and the right to freedom of assembly must protect the speaker or those assembling. And to hold otherwise would mean that freedom of speech and opinion is unduly subjected to a heckler's veto. Okay, so I've gone through the, the four issues that I, I, I identified earlier in relation to Section 18. 
I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on that and to continue the dialogue around that if we have a chance in, in questions and answers. What I want to do now is, is to move on to another contentious area, which is, again, something you'll all be familiar with, but the uh, recent uh, ban on the wearing of face coverings uh, and masks. And this is just a, a screenshot of the, um, the provision itself. It prohibits the wearing of face coverings, including face painting. So a painted face, it seems, would fall within the terms of the prohibition. Anything that is likely to prevent identification, okay? So it's likely to prevent identification, not intended to conceal one's identity, okay? It's a much wider uh, reach. Again, with quite a significant uh, liability attached to it, up to one year's imprisonment. Now, as I've noted, many people already know the reasonable excuse defense, which includes wearing masks for religious reasons or if there's a pre-existing medical or health condition, and I've seen people suggesting that we should continue to wear masks on the pretext that you're not feeling well, um, and, and, and that's an interesting way of engaging with, with the law. But what I want to say is that the um, ban on face coverings is certainly not unique to Hong Kong. Some of you will know that uh, in France, this has been a very contentious issue in the Gili Jun protests and that uh, a ban on wearing face coverings uh, in the vicinity of a demonstration without a legitimate reason was uh, criminalized in France. Uh, and so there's been quite a bit of reaction from the human rights community to the, the ban there. The Council of Europe uh, Commissioner for Human Rights uh, was very critical of this. She uh, released a very uh, scathing memorandum, which is worth reading, where she said that the increased penalties for intentional hiding of one's face um, without a legitimate reason are deeply problematic. It's a provision that undermines freedom of assembly, the without legitimate reason clause does not su provide sufficient protection against possible abuses, and it's liable to result in disproportionate infringements on both assembly uh, and protection. Now, Alex mentioned, and he was doing very well at the start, to get his mouth around the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and its Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. I don't know if any of you know what that organization is, but it's an it's a intergovernmental organization with 56 member states, um, so slightly larger than the Council of Europe. But I'm part of a, an expert group on freedom of assembly within the OSCE, and we published these guidelines on freedom of assembly, uh, first in 2007, second edition, which is this, in 2010, and we have a third edition, which is almost, almost ready um, for publication now. But in these guidelines, um, we've said uh, that face masks should be protected, and we've said no blanket or routine restrictions on the wearing of face masks uh, should be uh, allowed. And that's because wearing of masks can be important for expressive purposes. Um, we know that wearing masks can be used to express particular viewpoints or indeed religious beliefs. And uh, we've said that the standard should be that there should be no prohibition unless there is demonstrable evidence of imminent violence. Now, some would say that maybe doesn't go far enough that there needs to be perhaps demonstrable evidence of imminent violence on the part of those being asked to remove their masks. Okay, and it's a, it's a very tricky line to, to draw. And again, we can maybe talk about this in, uh, in questions and answers. But the draft general comment, and this again is a different text from the text that you will read if you go online at the moment and look at the, the text of the draft general comment, because this was as a result of discussions on Friday. Um, and the Human Rights Committee spent more than an hour, I think, discussing the draft of this particular paragraph dealing with masks. So this is the current text. As I've said, there will be room for engagement on this between now and, and January. And I would urge you all, given your very close experience with these issues, to engage with the Human Rights Committee's uh, consultative process. But they've said the wearing of face coverings or other disguises may be part of the expressive element of a peaceful assembly, or they may serve to counter reprisals. So it's not just that we wear masks 
because we want to express something, but that we want to do so for safety reasons, to prevent ourselves from being identified. And that's interesting because it, it goes so far as saying we ought to be able to wear masks to conceal our identity because concealing our identity is important for our safety. And it says, it doesn't really make the link very clear, but it says that this is in the context of new surveillance technologies. And so obviously with increased facial recognition technologies, the fear and the chilling effect of being identified and how that might impact on future participation in assemblies, what the authorities might do with the, uh, the surveillance material they've gathered, um, all of that goes to actually justify the wearing of masks, not to justify the prohibi prohibition of the wearing of masks. And again, they use this language of imminent violence um, and currently blanket bans can only be justified in extreme cases. So I'm going to skip this. This was what uh, the, the administration here said about... Um, why the police engage in video recording of demonstrations. On that, if anybody's interested in this area, there's a very interesting development just again from last week with the information commissioner in the UK issued a memorandum saying that there needs to be a statutory code of conduct dealing with police powers to use facial recognition technology, that this is an area where police use of technology has outpaced the legal regulation of that technology, and there's a need to reassert legal regulation and to emphasize standards such as strict necessity. So it's worth having a look at not only the memorandum, but what will follow from this in terms of a statutory code of conduct. Okay, now this is the last point I was going to, to make, and I'm going to very... Uh, to rush it quite significantly. But one of the things that we've paid a lot of attention to in, in the OSC work is the role of monitors and the role of journalists also in uh, reporting on freedom of assembly. And we have this handbook on monitoring freedom of peaceful assembly. Again, some references to the European Court of Human Rights. The court has said it's incumbent on the press to impart information and ideas and matters of public interest. And this includes reporting on opposition gatherings and demonstrations, which is essential for the development of any democratic society. Um, <coughs> there have been various bodies from the OSCE to the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Freedom of Assembly. The next slide is uh, uh, from the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, but emphasizing that the right to report uh, on demonstrations and the right to monitor demonstrations, including the right to photograph the police, is something that is protected under the right to freedom of peaceful assembly. Okay, and that's significant. We've not had ever a normative basis for the protection of this kind of activity before. And what the Human Rights Committee is saying in, uh, in draft general comment 37, this is just again a special rapporteur. I'm going to flick through the African Commission on Human Rights. But draft general comment says uh, that... The role of journalists, human rights defenders, monitors, and others engaged in observing, documenting, and reporting on assemblies is of special importance and is protected under Article 21. And that's also even if an assembly is declared unlawful and is dispersed, that does not terminate the right of monitors to cover it. It might even increase the need, as we all know, for that coverage to be facilitated. So... Um, I was going to talk about the core problem. Yeah, but, do I? Yeah, yeah. Do you, I? You could do it, yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, the key issue with monitors and journalists in many countries, whether that's Belarus, France, the US, the UK, is that the police fail to distinguish monitors from protest participants, and they treat monitors as if they were on the side of the protesters. And it may well be that monitors are on the side of protesters and some legal observers will be gathering information on behalf of protesters so that that evidence can be used in court should it be needed. And that gives rise to a perception on the part of the authorities that they are partial and therefore effectively one and the same as participants. 
And what these standards are saying is it doesn't really matter um, how they are perceived, but that the role of monitors, whatever it might be, and the next slide I've, I've put up a list of different roles that monitors can serve, okay? And it's up to each different monitoring initiative to decide how it frames its own mandate, what its focus is. So some monitors will look exclusively at the police. Some monitors will look at the actions of the police and the demonstrators. Some monitors don't want to do that because it feels like they're surveilling the demonstrators when the demonstrators are already subjected to significant surveillance. And therefore, that one of the roles of monitoring is to correct asymmetries of visibility, okay? So in, in a world characterized by pervasive state surveillance, then monitoring is a way of responding to that uh, and providing a set of eyes on the police and providing some measure of accountability in that way. But the key point here is that all these different roles ought to be protected. And going back to the previous slide, they ought to be protected within the scope of the right to freedom of peaceful assembly. So again, happy to, to um, take questions uh, on that if we have time. And this is my concluding slide, okay? So I've emphasized as I've gone through that General Comment 37 is in process. But the standards in General Comment 37 uh, are not a foregone conclusion. And there are some blind spots in the jurisprudence, and there are some aspects, whether it's around masks or whether it's around facial recognition technology, where there isn't a strong jurisprudential base, and we need to make a convincing argument to the Human Rights Committee so that General Comment 37 has very robust standards, because it will be around for a long time. And it will be the standard-setting document, as I said at the start, that is used to assess state reports to the Human Rights Committee and individual applications to the Human Rights Committee um, in, its, uh, in terms of individual cases. And where does that take us in terms of the public order ordinance? Well, what I'm about to say may strike you as being incredibly naive or optimistic um, or deluded, uh, but I can do that. Um, and uh, that is to say that right at the start, I said the public order ordinance predates the present crisis. Okay? And there is an argument there to be said that this is something not of present day making, but something that has been on the cards for a long time, something around which reform has been advocated for a long time, and indeed something around which, if we are looking for ways in which to create constructive dialogue with the authorities, might possibly be one area to focus on. And it's crucial, I think, because I said at the start too, that there's a crisis of legitimacy in terms of policing, and that unlike or like in Northern Ireland, this is not going to be one through a security response. There needs to be a political solution to the current crisis. Um, and on, if we go down this path of a security response, it will only further uh, exacerbate the crisis of legitimacy in policing. And the only way in which we can extricate ourselves from a crisis of legitimacy in policing is to think about um, how standards around the protection and regulation of freedom of assembly might be uh, improved so that the framing of the police power is not about uh, directing and controlling assembly, it's not about managing assembly, but it is about crucially facilitating and protecting this fundamental right of peaceful assembly. Now, I have desperately run over and I'm going to stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. It's really, uh, really so much there, I think, that people here can, can, can see the, um, the importance of, and, and you did a fantastic expert job of covering it all uh, and in such a fascinating, engaging way. Uh, there's, I mean, I wish we could have you here for an entire week, really, to, to speak on these issues. I wish um, so, too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Dr. Hamilton has to catch a flight uh, in a few hours, so we, 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 but we do have some time for some uh, Q&A, and that's really an important aspect of what we're hoping to do, is not just to bring in uh, great uh, academic 
stars to come and speak on these issues, but also have an opportunity for people to uh, engage with them and ask questions of them and for there to be a two-way uh, exchange as well. So um, with that said, I, I will uh, happily open the floor to some, some questions, please. For that very informative and insightful presentation, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is uh, whether in the drafting of uh, General Comment 37, has there any thoughts been given to civil disobedience uh, and how to uh, incorporate uh, in designing the framework uh, for protest law and, and the protection of the rights to assembly? Uh, the second question is about violent uh, protest. Um, how do you, is, is there any definition in the drafting of General 30, uh, General Common 37 or the broader jurisprudence uh, of the definition of violence? Uh, because uh, as you well know that uh, vandalism um, is not equivalent to uh, bodily injury. Uh, I wonder your thoughts about this. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, on the civil disobedience question, uh, some of you may know who the, the committee's rapporteur who is in charge of drafting General Comment 37 is Professor Christoph Heinz, who's a professor at Pretoria in South Africa, and his own PhD was actually on the very topic of civil disobedience. So he is keen for civil disobedience to be reflected in the text. Now, it can't be expanded upon at great length in the text because the right is of peaceful assembly and they're, in some ways they're, they're different concepts. But there is a reference to uh, peaceful civil disobedience. I'm, I, I'm really sure, I, I'm not going to try and find the, the paragraph right now, but there is, I, I, I think, a reference to it. Um, it does emphasize, again, the, the nature of peacefulness, okay? And in some ways it goes to this distinction between peacefulness and lawfulness, okay? That where people break the law and knowingly break the law and do so as an act of civil disobedience, recognizing the consequences of breaking the law, perhaps not accepting those consequences as legitimate, but nonetheless recognizing those consequences, um, that any sanction must be proportionate. Um, and so, you know, even in acts of civil disobedience, the standards of necessity and proportionality still adhere. There is also a discussion around what constitutes violent assemblies. Um, and, you know, the, it, it's very easy just to define violence or peacefulness in terms of their opposite. So that violence is um, everything that's not peaceful and peacefulness is everything that's not violent. Uh, and it's not particularly helpful. Um, but um, the, the committee, I don't think want to get into providing examples of what constitutes um, violence. There, there are aspects in the jurisprudence where they talk about coercive behavior or intimidation um, and where, for example, the European Court of Human Rights has said that intimidating behavior does not necessarily meet the, the threshold of violence and cases where people have perhaps pushed back against security uh, private security guards or even the police and has been pushing and that is not regarded as violence sufficient to exclude it from the protective scope of the right of assembly. So there are interesting issues there and, and, and I would say more probably in the jurisprudence than in the text of, of General Comment 37. The one key issue there that the committee is actually struggling with is in relation to hate speech and the, pro the, the provision under Article 20, Paragraph 2 of the Covenant, which requires states to prohibit hate speech. And there's a debate around whether the advocacy of violence under Article 22 should be something that is covered in the general comment relating to the scope of the right of freedom of peaceful assembly, um, or whether the advocacy of violence, as it's stated in Article 22 should instead only be something that is considered in the restrictions part of the general comment. So there's a question of what should be in the scope of the right of peaceful assembly and what should be considered only when it comes to justification for restrictions on the exercise of the right of assembly and hate speech as well. Should that be built into the definition of peaceful assembly so that anything at which hate speech occurs would be excluded from the protective scope or we, ex we include hate speech 
as part of a protected assembly, but recognizing that that can legitimately be restricted if a certain threshold is met. So there are, there are complicated issues around the definition of, of peacefulness. Um, thanks. Any question? Anyone? Thoughts, even comments, perhaps? Yes, please, Margaret. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamilton. Uh, I'm sorry to say that everything you said today is directly relevant, uh, that our police and our government have broken every principle that you have put up in your slides, and some are broken by our courts. And the question that we are wondering in, my, in our minds is, what are we going to do about it? You, in, you very usefully put up, the, in conclusion, we can do the two things, and certainly we ought to be doing those. But in the meantime, what can Hong Kong do to, to bring home to the police, the government, even our courts, these principles and their importance? That's a question that I didn't want to be asked. <laughs> uh, it's a question I feared, but I mean, I, I, I think there's a really difficult position at the moment, and it's, a, you know, I, the, what I'm about to say is not in any way condoning or lending sympathy to the actions of the police, because I think clearly there have been excessive use of force, clearly there are issues around the proportionality of the police response and all of that. But I also think the police have been placed in an invidious position by this legislation, which confers very wide-ranging powers on them. It gives them that discretion. They have filled that role. You know, they have, they have lived up in some ways to the ego image that the, the legislation creates about directing and controlling assemblies. And until you can have an honest conversation about, well, maybe that's not the role of the police, it's actually, when I think of the Northern Ireland parallel, when the reforms to policing and when the setting up of this uh, body, the Parades Commission, were first uh, talked about, there was a fear that the police would think this was taking away the, the core raison d'etre of the police, that the police would lose any reason for existing if you, if you took their public order decision-making powers away. And quite the opposite, the police were hugely relieved not to have this burden placed on them. And they could stand behind and simply say, we're not, we didn't make this decision, we're just implementing the, the decisions of, of this other body. Uh, and it, it really served to allow other policing reforms around you know, the representativeness of the police, the accountability bodies for the police, um, and so on, to take root and to become more embedded. So there has to be a way, and I don't know what the the immediate answer is, but there has to be a way found where the police themselves can be extricated from the situation that they are currently placed in. And that's, that's not easy. Um. Yes, please. No, um, maybe a more simple question. Is there any international um, standards on, on what kind of weapons can be used in and crowd control, controlling protest. In terms of tear gas, uh, you might know that recently Hong Kong police have been using allegedly Chinese-made um, tear gas, which explodes mm -hmm. and burn people, and burn the ground. And is there any um, 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 discussion or international standard on this? Yes, there is. Uh, you know, and, and the guidelines that I, that I mentioned in the slides on use of less lethal weapons, and you know that the, this terminology is not, it used to be people talked about non-lethal weapons, but of course weapons that were described as non-lethal could equally be lethal depending on how they were used. So there's been a shift in terminology, but it's something that, uh, again, Christoph Heinz and the Geneva Academy have very, uh, have done quite a lot of work on, uh, uh, and these guidelines on less lethal weapons are the outworking of, of that. Um, there are also interesting groups that track where weapons are imported from and look at. Um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's an organization in the UK called the Omega Foundation, 
um, that do a lot of work in tracing where particular munitions are bought and sold to. Uh, you know, so when you mention the Chinese tear gas, that, that's something that they may well have, have already tracked. But I can remember there were issues around when I looked at uh, the policing of the Gezi Park protests in, in Turkey and in Istanbul um, back in 2014. Again, for example, the firing of tear gas canisters and people being hit by the canisters, not you know, just being affected by the tear gas, was a real issue. And so the guidelines in this do emphasize that you know, firing tear gas should not be done at individuals, and, and there are certain core minimum standards around, uh, around the use of that and water cannon similarly. I actually, I actually, I actually also read that guideline, but it, okay. it doesn't. It doesn't say <laughs> yeah. that. So it says you cannot use tear gas in certain cir cir yeah. certain circumstances, certain ways. But it doesn't say you cannot use the tear gas that explodes or burn people. Yeah, I think. Well, I, th I think this is. It's a really difficult one because you're not going to get guidelines on these types of weapons that say you can't use it. And the reason for that is that police will make the argument that these weapons, so if, if you set up a, you know, a spectrum of different crowd control weapons, water cannon, for example, can be used to good effect. And I say that advisedly. I don't want to be quoted in that, but I fear it's, it's, the, it's the one sound bite that may get taken up. But water cannon um, can be used in a way that enables an effective de-escalation of a crowd control situation because it creates a distance between the police and the protesters. And if the police respond to that uh, thoughtfully without necessarily trying to take the space that they have just created, but then withdraw that that, you know, it, so these kinds of weapons and their design are actually certainly in the way you're seeing them being used, are inflammatory and escalatory and causing serious injury and all the rest. But the reason why the guidelines are more muted on their use and don't argue for their outright prohibition is that they are seen in some ways as a less harmful... Um, you know, of course, we've seen live ammunition as well, and I think there's a, there's a clear line to be drawn, and I think it's quite shocking that police in crowd control situations are being deployed with uh, live ammunition. That, you know, that, that just should be off the table. And the, the questions around police operational planning, I think, are really critical in this as well, because as an outsider, I've been watching you know, the, 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 the journalistic footage of some of the, the key incidents from here. And it's hard to interpret it, okay? You can interpret it generously and you can say this was a small group of officers who got isolated uh, and, and, you know, were fearing for their, for their life. Or you can say it's fundamentally a failure in organizational planning that allowed those officers to be there in the first place. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and so it's less charitable towards the, the police. And I, and I think we have to think of the use of crowd control weapons within the context of well-planned operations that take sufficient account. The Human Rights Committee said it itself about police training in Hong Kong that greater account needs to be taken of the principles of proportionality and necessity in police training. But how you implement that and how you begin to instigate reforms in police training, I don't know. You know that in Northern Ireland, that only came about as part of a political agreement, uh, as part of uh, a negotiated solution uh, and the, the, the policing reforms that Chris Patton introduced through the Independent Commission on Policing, you know, came about at that key mark point in the, in the process, but it, it wasn't something that the police voluntarily, voluntarily signed up for. Um, if we can just, I think you, you, you have the freedom to, to be as, as uh, brief as you, as you like uh, uh, with, our, with our questions, because I know you're, you're pressed for time. But uh, I'll take the three that, that hands that I just saw. I'll take them one, two, and three. Yeah. So please, go ahead. Um, thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Um, I, I certainly agree with all the principles here laying down, especially about the policing. Um, but I think the fact is that I think most of the people here agree, but we're not the people who are actually execute the law because we're not the police. We are smart people. And 
I'm not saying they are not, but you have to, for example, admit that only around 20% or even less than the police in Hong Kong are degree holders, university degree holders. So it comes to me that uh, is it possible that you share some um, good or interesting example of police control, police education, or um, police guiding uh, that, that, could, that, that could enlighten us? Because to me, it would be a little bit unrealistic if these rules are on books and in our mind, but actually we don't really have a very good tactic or policy of transplanting these to the police themselves. Thank you. Um, we'll take... Yes, please, go ahead. I think there's a button there below you, if you can see it. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your speech. Uh, I personally think that there's been um, kind of elements from all, all four styles that you mentioned on protest policing in the academic literature you mentioned earlier, but from an outsider point of view and, and from your point of view as a professor, what do you feel like um, the policing, the protest policing now has taken, which, which method has it been mainly? Thank you. And I think there was one question here as well. Yes. Okay. Great, great questions. Um, I will leave it to your discretion uh, how much time it's your flight to catch or to, not, right. or to not catch. But <laughs> as long as there's nothing blocking the road to the airport, then, then we're all right. Uh, okay. Um, great questions. And, uh, so the first one on, on, on educating the police. Um, I think there's a real challenge here that human rights principles get raised in a way which is antagonistic to the police and that the way in which educating the police gets done reinforces the us and them uh, and the idea and the, uh, the police then feel that human rights are something that is used against the police that it is a way of um, critiquing always the police rather than helping the police see human rights as integral to what the police do, okay? And, and so how do, you, how do you avoid doing one and ensure doing the other? Um, my experience in this is really only from Northern Ireland where universities actually were involved in giving police training. So I was involved, for example, in, in some of the training around public order police training in Northern Ireland that came out of the, the Patton reforms where we had classrooms full of, of public order commanders and it was a kind of training of trainers exercise where they then took the principals and uh, trained other officers but it was, it was very hard to break down that initial barrier where they felt that we were lecturing them okay, and to, to start to ensure that the police as I said a moment ago, see these human rights principles not only as central to their mandate and what they do, but actually helpful to them in delivering effective policing. You know, because I'm quite sure that there are police officers who are out in the streets here who do not want to be in the position that they're in, uh, who, want, you know, who want to find a way where the principles that we're espousing can be upheld, and it, it, you know, it, it is a process, again, in Northern Ireland, it was very difficult for the police to open the doors to outside organizations in terms of training. That wasn't something that they were comfortable with initially, but it, it, it happened, and it still happens as far as I know to this, this day. There's, you know, there are a wider range of stakeholders who are engaged in the training process. Um, so I, I'll leave it at that, but... Um, which policing style? I don't know. I think, I think you're right in your hunch that all of them are visible in different ways. The one I think that's in some ways most interesting from an academic point of view for me is the negotiated management one because it's, it's one where you have the public order ordinance here which 
the, the administration is keen to insist that this is a notification system rather than an authorization system. And what happens in a negotiated management uh, scenario is that you're meant to have dialogue between equal partners. And of course, we know that the power relations between protesters and the police is anything but a dialogue between equal, equal partners. And so that's why there's a, you know, there's there's quite a healthy scepticism around negotiated management as a, as, a, as a style. Having said that, it is quite clearly a good thing if protesters and the police have a degree of trust, that there is early communication on a voluntary basis, okay? And that's, I think, the crucial element around that particular principle, that any dialogue on the part of protesters should be voluntary and that they shouldn't be penalised for not volunteering to engage with the authorities in any way. Uh, and, I, and I'd say, you know, I don't, I don't see any evidence of a dialogue going on at the moment. Certainly in the media reportage that I've seen, that seems to be wholly absent. Uh, and that's, I think, that's part of the way in which it plays out, where the, the erosion of trust precludes any kind of openings for dialogue at all. But... Um, so when I say I'm sceptical about negotiated management, that doesn't mean I discount the need for dialogue and for relations of trust to be built somehow. Um, but I think when you look at escalated force, clearly when you think of uh, command and control, when you think of strategic incapacitation, there are elements of all of, of all of those going on. And sometimes we don't even know how much of each is going on. I was reading some interesting stuff about facial recognition and the question of what actually is being gathered, you know, and it's hard to tell. You know, it's hard to tell about undercover deployments. It's hard to tell what strategies the police sometimes use. Um, so in order to say definitively which style is being deployed, um, it's easier just to say there's a mix. <laughs> And the last one, sorry, the Parades Commission and the, and, the, and the body. It was a novel approach, okay? And in, in Northern Ireland, um, the crisis of legitimacy in policing was in part that uh, the police were not representative of both ethnic, political, religious communities in Northern Ireland. And what the government thought was a good idea, they, they created an independent commission to look at what was the public order order in Northern Ireland and to come up with uh, a new mechanism. And this, mecha this process was chaired by uh, Sir Peter North, who was a vice chancellor of Oxford University at, at one point. And he had a priest uh, and another couple of experts involved in that commission reviewing the, the existing mechanisms. And they come, came up with this idea to have a civic body that would be appointed by the government with up to nine members, one chair, up to nine members, um, and that this body would have the responsibility to receive notifications about upcoming public processions and to, dis to decide whether to impose restrictions on those processions. And so this body, called the Parades Commission, um, would take evidence from the police, but the police... You know, we sometimes think, or the police like to think of themselves as the public order experts. Um, Stuart Hall talks about the police as the primary definers of order. And the Parades Commission mechanism decentered the police, okay? It made them just one out of many participants in this process. Perhaps a key participant, but they gave evidence to the Parades Commission, and the Parades Commission then arrived at a decision about whether to impose restrictions. Those restrictions could be challenged through an internal administrative process and ultimately through, the, through judicial review in the courts. But the police did not make the decisions, uh, and the police, as I said earlier, simply said, well, we are policing, those, we're implementing those decisions, and it, it provided a buffer, a cushion for the police Yeah. So initially, there was quite a preponderance of, of lawyers. Um, initially, when it was set up in 98, um, there were, I think, four or five solicitors or barristers on it. Um, and that has changed a little bit where you now have 
uh, you have business leaders, you have people who have maybe been involved in mediating some of these contentious disputes uh, as perhaps professional mediators, as chairs of local business forums who have you know, tried to resolve uh, disputes around parading because of the interests of traders in a particular area, so they've had a, a hands-on experience of dealing between interested parties. So you get a whole range of people, but you apply, actually. The, the posts are advertised, and then you get interviewed. I got interviewed. I never got appointed. Um, you get interviewed um, for the Parades Commission, and they, they appoint a body that is supposed, in the terms of the legislation, to be broadly representative of the community of Northern Ireland. What, what representative means is, is an interesting question in itself, but it's, it's, it's clearly a move away from public order expertise and a widening out of, of, of that decision-making process. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's... Um, it, it, yeah. I mean, this is, this is I really, I think, in, in, in Dr. Hamilton's defense, uh, on, some of the, on some of the more optimistic proposals here, I, I suppose that is one of the uh, privileges of academic life, is that we, we can engage in this sort of blue sky, uh, optimistic yeah, thinking. I, I, I agree. I mean, I think it is quite fantastical to be thinking about some of the, those kinds of mechanisms at the present moment. But in the long term, mm. it, it's an interesting it's an interesting model, and there, you know, there are other interesting models out there as well. Yes, yeah, please, please. May I just say uh, one uh, hopeful uh, point? Uh, that is, we can only improve from here because according to a recent survey, I don't know whether you're aware of it, 51 point something percent of the public has zero confidence in the police. So from this, I hope we can only improve. Yeah, it, it, would be hard, it would be hard for us to, to have a, have a, have a, uh, a more um, serious challenge when it comes to the uh, crisis of legitimacy, as you put it. I think that the one point, just to, just to sort of in closing, that I thought was really uh, valuable to take away was the idea that the, the governing legislation, the, the legal framework around public order, really creates a shape that the authorities then fill, you know, either expand to fill or contract. And so... Um, we, we, we shouldn't, I think, lose sight of that idea that, you know, it may seem like this is the way things are and that's just how things are, but actually there are systematic, systemic, structural characteristics of the system. That's a lot of use of the word system. Uh, around which that, the, that the, the, the individuals and groups are behaving within those, those, those frameworks. And if we can think about positive uh, proposals for, for improving the frameworks that we have, maybe we can get to a better place. Um, so I, I, do, I do share some, some optimism on this, uh, despite how challenging things might feel. So um, if you'll please join me in, in thanking Dr. Hamilton for what well, was an excellent talk. Thank you.